Well, Area 51 is at once the most secret and most well-known airfield in the world. Born amid Cold War secrecy, it has become an object of mystery in modern popular culture, colored by allegations of involvement with UFOs, aliens, and sinister conspiracies. Recent availability of declassified government documents and photographs makes it possible to cut through the fog of dark rumors and speculation to reveal the true legacy of one of the nation's premier assets for flight test and evaluation of cutting-edge aviation technology. During the early 1950s, international tensions ran high between the United States and the Russian-dominated Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. U.S. defense officials feared that the Soviets were building a vast fleet of bombers and intercontinental missiles. Development of reconnaissance satellites was still nearly a decade away, but intelligence analysts were eager to see behind the Soviet Iron Curtain. To accomplish this, the Central Intelligence Agency contracted Lockheed's Advanced Development Projects Division, better known as the Skunk Works, to develop an airplane capable of carrying cameras and sensors to high altitudes beyond the range of anti-aircraft missiles. The result was Project Aquatone, a lightweight airplane with long tapered straight wings and powered by a single jet engine. For security reasons, the airplane, known as the U-2, was to be tested at a remote location, far from observation by unauthorized personnel. Lockheed test pilot Tony Levere scouted numerous locations around the southwestern United States, paying particular attention to sites with dry lake beds that could serve as natural landing fields. U-2 designer Clarence Kelly Johnson developed plans for a small airstrip and temporary support facilities that could be built within a limited budget of just over $200,000. Revised CIA requirements entailing a nearly 300% expansion and more permanent facility drove construction costs up to $450,000. Aquatone Program Director Richard M. Bissell, Jr. reviewed 50 potential sites with his Air Force liaison, Colonel Osmond J. Ozzie Ritlin, but none of them seemed to fit the stringent security requirements of the program. Ritland, however, recalled a little X-shaped field in southern Nevada that he had flown over many times during his involvement with nuclear weapons testing. Nellis Auxiliary Field No. 1 was located just off the eastern side of Groom Dry Lake, about 85 miles northwest of Las Vegas, and just outside the Atomic Energy Commission's nuclear proving ground at Yucca Flat. In April 1955, Levere, Johnson, Bissell, and Ritland flew to Nevada on a two-day survey expedition of the most promising lake beds. After examining Groom Lake, it was obvious that this was the ideal location for a test site. It offered excellent flying weather and unparalleled remoteness. The abandoned auxiliary airfield was overgrown and unusable, but the three-mile diameter lake bed was ideal. Construction began the following month. The lake bed served as an airfield, but there was also a 5,000-foot asphalt runway. And although uh, costs eventually totaled around $832,000, Kelly Johnson felt the government had gotten a very good deal. The base included a control tower, three hangars, a few warehouses, administrative buildings, dispensary, and a dining hall. The few amenities included a movie theater and a volleyball court. The airfield's proximity to the atomic proving ground meant that the base lay directly in the downwind path of radioactive fallout from above-ground nuclear tests. But AEC perimeter and airspace restrictions helped shield the operation from public view. Rudimentary accommodations for personnel included about three dozen mobile home trailers and an 18-room dormitory. Kelly Johnson proposed naming the base Paradise Ranch an ironic choice that he later admitted was a dirty trick to lure workers to the U-2 project. <laughs> CIA officials ultimately named the test site Watertown Airstrip, but Lockheed workers continued to call it the ranch. In May 1955, a spokesman for the AEC Las Vegas field office announced that he had instructed Reynolds Electrical and Engineering Company to begin preliminary work on a small satellite Nevada test site installation a few miles northeast of Yucca Flat and within the Las Vegas Bombing and Gunnery Ranch. The facility was described as essentially temporary. 
A press release drafted for the AEC by CIA officials was distributed to 18 media outlets in Nevada and Utah, including a dozen newspapers, four radio stations, and two television stations. Personnel arrived at Watertown from Burbank and Las Vegas on Air Force C-54 transports. An initial cadre of 75 test personnel grew to 250 during the U-2 training operations. In 1957, the base population peaked at 1,250 persons. Each U-2 was transported, disassembled, to Watertown in an Air Force C-124 cargo plane. Workers then reassembled the airplanes and readied them for testing. Tony Levere made the first flight in the U-2 in the summer of 1955. He and several other Lockheed test pilots performed basic flying qualities and performance evaluations. The U-2 eventually demonstrated a maximum cruising altitude above 70,000 feet. By 1956, the first of several classes of CIA and Air Force pilots had begun training. Several airplanes were lost in accidents, and two CIA pilots and one Lockheed test pilot perished. At the direction of the CIA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, the predecessor to NASA, drafted a press release as part of an elaborate cover story to conceal the airplane's reconnaissance mission. The statement announced a program in which U-2 aircraft would conduct high-altitude weather research for the NACA with Air Force support while operating the Watertown Strip. To support this cover story, all U-2 aircraft were painted in NACA markings and carried weather research instrumentation during training missions. The results were published in unclassified NACA reports available to the public. In preparation for the Nevada Test Site's 1957 nuclear test series, Operation Plum Bob, the AEC issued an information booklet to news media called Background Information on Nevada Nuclear Tests. It included a brief section describing the Watertown facility and noted that while the area had been joined to the air closure space over the NTS, in which unauthorized aircraft were prohibited, it had not been made part of the NTS itself. Under the heading Watertown Project, the booklet included the NACA cover story, noting that U-2 jet aircraft with special characteristics for flight at exceptionally high altitudes have been flown from the Watertown Strip with logistical and technical support by the Air Weather Service of the U.S. Air Force to make weather observations at heights that cannot be attained by most aircraft. The early part of Plum Bob nuclear test series caused interruptions in the activities at Watertown because the airstrip was downwind of the nuclear proving ground, and most personnel were required to evacuate the base prior to each detonation. The AEC closely monitored radiation levels in the Groom Lake area and tried to ensure that expected fallout from any given shot would be limited so as to permit re-entry of personnel within a few weeks. Project 57, the first shot of Plum Bob, took place on Watertown's doorstep. On April 24, 1957, the AEC conducted a safety experiment with an XW-25 warhead in Area 13, just five miles northwest of Groom Lake. Full-scale nuclear detonations began a month later, causing fallout and blast damage at Watertown. The AEC measured radiation exposure inside the evacuated buildings and vehicles at the base to study the effectiveness of various materials for shielding against fallout. In effect, Watertown served as a laboratory to determine the shielding qualities of typical building materials that might be found in any rural American town. Shot hood caused more substantial damage to the air base. The device, lofted by balloon to a height of 1,500 feet, exploded with a yield of 74 kilotons. Although the explosion took place 14 miles southwest of Watertown, the shock wave shattered windows on two buildings, broke a dormitory ventilator panel, and buckled metal doors on two other buildings. The Groom Lake base had always been intended to be a temporary facility. As U-2 testing began to wind down and CIA and Air Force pilot classes completed training, Watertown became a virtual ghost town. By mid-June 1957, U-2 test operations had moved to Edwards Air Force Base, California, and operational U-2 aircraft were assigned to a base in Del Rio, Texas, as well as various detachments around the world. 
the Watertown facility was put into caretaker status. In June 1958, the government withdrew 38,400 acres of land encompassing the Watertown base from public access under Public Land Order 1662. This rectangular addition to the Nevada test site was designated Area 51. It is interesting to note that the boundaries encompassing Area 51 left nearly the entire northern half of the lake bed outside the base perimeter. As it became apparent that the high-flying U-2 would soon be vulnerable to hostile missiles, the CIA sought a successor that could fly higher and faster and be less visible to radar. Lockheed was again selected to build the new reconnaissance aircraft under Project Oxcart. After discarding 11 designs in what Kelly Johnson called his Archangel series, his A-12 concept was selected for production. The plane's titanium airframe featured rounded delta wings and two turbo ramjet engines that propelled the A-12 to a cruising speed of Mach 3.2 and altitudes up to 90,000 feet. Twin inwardly canted tails, a sawtooth internal structure in the wing edges, and special composite materials contributed to a low radar signature. In 1959, EG&G built a radar cross-section measurement range at Area 51 in order to perform tests with A-12 scale models and full-size mock-ups. An AEC spokesman announced construction of the EG&G facility at what he called Project 51 at Groom Lake. The announcement was necessary because publicity gen was generated by a labor dispute. An article in the Las Vegas Review Journal noted that Groom Lake is ideally suited to secret projects because experimental aircraft can take off and land without detection from any outside point. Lockheed built a small 1 8 scale model of the A-12 for RCS testing and mounted it on a 22-foot inflatable bag within line of sight of the radar at a distance of half a mile. The bag was nearly transparent to radar, but incapable of supporting the weight of a full-size model, and so a larger pylon was also built. Several full-scale models of varying configuration were tested on a 50-foot pole in the center of a concrete pad on the west side of the lake bed, one mile north of the eg and radar building. The pole, designed by Lockheed engineer Henry Combs, was built from three propeller shafts of the type used on Navy destroyers, welded end to end. A secret base was needed to test the new spy plane, but the old Watertown airstrip was not suitable, and the infrastructure for such a program was not available at Groom Lake. Although a new air base could be built at great expense, the CIA did not at first consider this a viable option. Ten U.S. Air Force bases programmed for closure were considered as per possible alternatives, but none provided the required security, and annual operating costs for most were prohibitive. Groom Lake was ultimately selected, and Lockheed made an estimate of requirements for monthly fuel consumption, hangars, maintenance facilities, housing, and runway specifications. The CIA then produced a plan for construction and engineering. The stage is now set to make Area 51 a permanent facility. Base construction began in earnest in September 1960 and continued on a double shift schedule until June 1964. Essential facilities completed the first year included new hangars, housing, workshops, fuel storage, administration buildings, a commissary, control tower, and fire stations. Recreational facilities included a gymnasium, movie theater, basketball and squash courts, a three-hole golf course, and a softball diamond. An indoor swimming pool doubled as a water survival training facility. An 8,500-foot-long concrete runway was built to accommodate the A-12. It was equipped with a 6,500-foot paved overrun onto the lake bed for emergency use. In the event that this was not sufficient, an abort circle was painted on the surface of the dry lake bed. Unpaved crosswind runways were also marked on the lake bed for contingencies. Support aircraft began arriving in the spring of 1962. These included eight F-101B and F-model Voodoos for training and chase, a C-130 for car cargo transport, a U-3B for administrative use, Cessna 210D for liaison use, and HH-43B helicopter for search and rescue. 
a Lockheed F-104 also served as a chase plane. Protective services were provided by contract security guards. Security was paramount because at the time, the mere existence of the A-12 was a closely guarded secret. Area 51 had its own meteorology office to provide weather information for air crews. The base also had its own fire department. To prepare for actual emergencies, firefighters practiced at the crash pit on the west side of the base. In April 1962, the prototype A-12 had three first flights piloted by Lou Schock of Lockheed. For the unofficial maiden flight on April 24th, he flew the aircraft less than two miles at an altitude of about 20 feet. The following day, Schock made a 40-minute flight to test the airplane's basic handling qualities. The official first flight on April 30th was witnessed by a number of dignitaries, including Kelly Johnson, Richard Bissell, Director of the National Reconnaissance Office, Joseph Cherick, and FAA Chief Najib Halaby. All of the A-12 aircraft were initially based at Area 51. Test aircraft and the A-12T trainer were housed in hangars at the north end of the flight line, while operational aircraft for Project Oxcart were kept in hangars at the southern end of the base. The elite cadre of Oxcart pilots was assigned to Detachment 1 of the 1129th Special Activities Squadron nicknamed the Roadrunners. With the assistance of the CIA, the Air Force entered into an agreement with Lockheed to build three prototypes of an interceptor version of the A-12 under Project Kedlock. Known as the AF-12, later changed to YF-12A, the design included a second crew position, air-to-air -air missiles, and a fire control radar. Jim Easton piloted the maiden flight of the YF-12A on August 7, 1963. After President Lyndon Johnson announced the existence of this aircraft in March 1964, the YF-12A test program was moved to Edwards Air Force Base to support that statement and ultimately provide a plausible cover for any sightings of Oxcart aircraft flying over the western U.S. By the mid-1960s, the site population at Area 51 exceeded 1,800, and contractors were working three shifts a day. Hughes, Honeywell, EG&G, Perkin Elmer, and Pratt & Whitney all had facilities at the site. Lockheed Constellation Transports made several flights a day, ferrying personnel from Burbank and Las Vegas to Groom Lake. In fact, between January 1961 and May 1968, Three constellations completed 11,495 flights, logging 12,897 flight hours and covering approximately 3,669,900 miles. During this time, they carried 492,205 passengers and 4,328,073 pounds of cargo. Those are some amazing numbers. During the course of the Oxcart program, Kelly Johnson developed an unmanned reconnaissance drone to be launched from a modified variant of the A-12. Designated D-21 and codenamed Tagboard, the stealthy drone was a ramjet-powered vehicle capable of reaching 90,000 feet and cruising at Mach 3.3. Two Oxcart-type aircraft, designated M-21, were purpose-built to launch Tagboard. Each was equipped with a rear seat for a launch systems operator, and a dorsal launch pylon. Following several successful tests in 1966, the second M21 was lost when the drone collided with the launch aircraft. Pilot Bill Park ejected safely, but launch officer Ray Torek perished. The tragic loss of an aircraft and crew member ended the use of the M21 as a launch aircraft, but it did not spell the end of tag board. In 1967, the D-21 was reconfigured for launch from a B-52 and redesignated D-21B. Two B-52H bombers were modified as launch aircraft under Project Senior Bowl. In order to attain Mach 3 ramjet ignition speeds, the drone was fitted with a powerful solid-fueled rocket booster. The unofficial first flight occurred on September 28, 1967, when a D-21B accidentally dropped due to a mechanical failure. The first actual launch attempt took place November 6th, and flight testing continued through July 1969. 
Although several operational D-21B flights took place, the results were disappointing and the project was canceled in 1971. In 1967, several A-12s were deployed to Kadena, Japan for Operation Black Shield. This series of reconnaissance flights over Southeast Asia provided a wealth of intelligence data regarding activities in Vietnam and North Korea. Although none of the aircraft were lost to hostile fire, one crashed in the South China Sea during a training mission, killing pilot Jack Weeks. Four other A-12s had been lost in accidents at or near Area 51, but only one of these, piloted by Walt Ray, was fatal. The surviving airframes were retired in June 1968 and placed in storage at Lockheed's facility in Palmdale, California. The A-12 remained unknown to the public for 12 more years, while the YF-12A and later SR-71 became some of the most famous airplanes in the world. In 1968, as the Oxcart program was winding down, the Air Force began using Area 51 as a test site for Soviet military aircraft that had been acquired from allies through diplomatic channels. The first such program, called Have Donut, involved technical and tactical evaluations of the MiG-21. To disguise the aircraft type in unclassified documentation, the MiG-21 was given the designation YF-110B. In a joint evaluation, it was flown against nearly all U.S. aircraft com combat aircraft types, allowing Air Force and Navy pilots to develop improved tactics for combating Eastern Bloc aircraft. A similar evaluation program in 1969, called Half Drill, Half Ferry, involved two MiG-17s. As in the earlier program, a small group of Air Force and Navy pilots conducted mock dogfights with a MiG-17 and evaluated its performance characteristics. Additionally, selected instructors from the Navy's Top Gun School flew sorties against the MiGs for familiarization purposes. The results of these programs were disseminated to operational combat units and provided a critical edge during the air war in Southeast Asia. Testing of foreign aircraft continued and expanded throughout the 1970s and 1980s. What began as a small project on a part-time additional duty basis evolved into a multi-squadron, presidentially directed special access program, the results of which are briefed to senior staff officers and national command authorities. Red Hats and Red Eagles pilots have evaluated numerous foreign aircraft types in an effort that continues to this day. Foreign tracking and missile control radar systems have also been evaluated at Area 51. A complex of actual and replica threat systems was set up to simulate a Soviet-style air defense complex and to provide an airborne radar cross-section measurement range. In 1977, the Air Force began funding improvements to Area 51 under Project SCORE event. Lieutenant Colonel Larry McLean was assigned as the site manager when the CIA transferred control of the test site to the Air Force Flight Test Center as a remote operating location. It was formally designated Detachment 3 AFFTC in the spring of 1979. Testing of Lockheed's HAB Blue demonstrator, the first airplane designed to be virtually invisible to radar, began in December 1977. So secret was its configuration that every time Hav Blue was rolled out of its hangar, uncleared personnel at the base were sequestered to prevent them from seeing the aircraft. Two Hav Blue vehicles completed a combined total of 88 flights in 20 months. Both were lost in non-fatal accidents. In October 1978, Lockheed conducted the first test of a stealth cruise missile prototype called Senior Prom. Six were built each somewhat resembling a subscale, unmanned version of Hav Blue. The demonstrators were launched from a C-130 and recovered by parachute. Although the tests were generally successful, an operational version of the senior prom never went into production. In January 1981, the Lockheed test team at Groom Lake accepted delivery of the first senior trend full-scale development prototype, designated YF-117A. Lockheed test pilot Hal Farley made the first flight on June 18, 1981. The Senior Trend Combined Test Force conducted developmental testing of the FSD prototypes 
as well as acceptance testing of production F-117A aircraft. Each airframe was delivered to Groom Lake for final assembly, functional check flights, and low observables verification before deployment to the 4450th Tactical Group at the nearby Tonopah Test Range. Northrop's Tacit Blue was the first aircraft to demonstrate a low radar cross-section with curved surfaces. Tacit Blue provided important data used in development of the B-2 and the E-8 Joint Stars airplanes, as well as the AGM-137 Tri-Service Standoff Attack Missile. Its unusual appearance earned Tacit Blue the nickname Whale, and the test team members referred to themselves as Whalers. Northrop test pilot Dick Thomas made the first flight of Tacit Blue on February 5, 1982. Flown by a team of one contractor and four Air Force pilots, Tacit Blue completed a total of 135 sorties in four years. In April 1996, it was declassified and delivered to the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force in Dayton, Ohio for permanent display. Because groom like site population continued to grow, the Air Force contracted EG&G to transport commuters to groom like in a fleet of six Boeing 737s. These flights, using the call sign Janet, carried personnel to Groom Lake and Tonopah Test Range from Las Vegas, Palmdale, and Burbank. Beginning in 1979, the Air Force began actively discouraging and at times preventing public or private entry to the Groom Mountains north of Area 51. Air Force personnel claimed it was in the interest of public safety and national defense. In 1981, the Air Force discreetly requested that 89,600 acres of land encompassing the range be legally withdrawn from public use. In fact, the Air Force seized the land in 1984, two years before congressional approval process was completed. As public access became increasingly restricted, facilities at Groom Lake expanded dramatically. During the mid-1980s, new dormitories replaced the older housing. Additional hangars were built, and the runway was extended 4,600 feet southeast of the lake bed because the north end was subject to flooding during the rainy season. As the cost of maintaining the concrete runway was increasingly prohibitive, AFFTC leadership determined that the most cost-effective solution would be to keep the southern half of the airstrip open until a new parallel paved strip could be completed in 1992. The original runway was eventually closed entirely. Area 51 received some unwanted publicity in 1994 when a number of former workers from the site sued the government, claiming that their health had been damaged by inhaling toxic fumes from waste materials burned in open trenches near the main base. For several months after the suit was first filed, the government refused to acknowledge the existence of the base itself. This is ironic considering it had been publicly admitted for several decades. Finally, the Defense Department was forced to acknowledge that there was an operating location at Groom Lake, but refused to provide a legal name for it, citing national security concerns. Further legal action was ultimately stalled in 1995 when, in response to the lawsuit, President Bill Clinton signed Presidential Determination No. 95-45, which stated in part, I find that it is in the paramount interest of the United States to exempt the United States Air Force's operating location near Groom Lake, Nevada, from any applicable requirement for disclosure to unauthorized persons of classified information concerning that operating location. Many observers took this to mean that in the absence of oversight, the Air Force could and would continue to get away with environmental abuses. To the contrary, analysis of commercially available satellite imagery of Groom Lake indicates that the burning of materials has apparently been halted at the site. The old burial trenches have undergone remediation, and a new landfill has been established far from populated areas of the base. Additionally, aircraft parking ramps contaminated from years of spilled fuels and lubricants have been excavated and replaced with fresh concrete. Area 51's secret nature has bred rumors and speculation among those that believe the government is hiding captured extraterrestrial spacecraft or even aliens at the site. Starting in 1989, Groups of UFO believers began camping out near the Nellis Range boundaries to watch for flying saucers near Groom Lake. 
As the news media caught wind of these so-called saucer base expeditions, print and television publicity was met with stony silence and terse denials from Air Force officials. This further fueled public speculation, spawned new rumors, and attracted still more publicity. Camera crews and tourists from around the world descended on the remote and forbidding Nevada desert. The Detachment 3 Security Force, comprised of Air Force and civilian contractor personnel, worked overtime to intercept these alien invaders. A few civilians discovered that some nearby hilltops with a bird's eye view of the secret base had been overlooked in the government's groom range land grab. Word quickly spread. Tourists sometimes camped out on the hilltops 24 hours a day for days at a time. Flight test operations and even ground activities had to be postponed or canceled at Area 51. In April 1995, the Air Force seized another 5,000 acres of public land to prevent civilians from viewing the base. So what is all this security protecting? Tantalizing clues about recent Dreamland programs have been slowly filtering out, and occasionally a new airplane is unveiled. Many others remain cloaked in secrecy, hidden behind such cryptic designations as YF-113H, YF-116A, YF-24, or simply Classified Advanced Technology Demonstration Prototype. In October 2002, Boeing uncloaked its secret bird of prey technology demonstrator that was used to pioneer revolutionary advances in low observables, aircraft design, and rapid prototyping. The project, initiated in 1992, was declassified because the technologies and capabilities developed during the program had become industry standards, and it was no longer necessary to conceal the aircraft's existence. The one-of-a-kind demonstrator was designed and built by the McDonnell Douglas Phantom Works Advanced Research and Development Organization in St. Louis using company funds. The Air Force provided flight test facilities, chase aircraft, engineering personnel, and one test pilot. The contractor provided two pilots, additional support personnel and equipment. After McDonnell Douglas merged with Boeing in August 1997, the Boeing company continued funding the project which spanned eight years and cost $67 million. The Bird of Prey, also known as the YF-118G, incorporated many new innovative concepts to reduce radar, infrared, and visual signatures. Only 38 missions were flown between 1996 and 1999, roughly one sortie per month. But how many more programs have yet to be revealed? While many current and historic programs at Area 51 remain classified, some information has been released to the public through formal announcements, published technical papers, and official personnel biographies that often reveal details of previously black projects. Based on these clues, it is apparent that since the early 1980s, there have been numerous manned and unmanned experimental projects at Groom Lake that have yet to be unveiled. Evaluation of foreign military aircraft and weapons systems remains a high priority as well. Support facilities at Groom Lake continue to expand. Satellite imagery reveals new hangars, administration buildings, and other infrastructure. In the post-Cold War era, Area 51 remains a very busy place. What was once a temporary camp has grown into a national test facility with an annual operating budget in excess of $200 million and staffed by approximately 500 military and civilian DOD personnel and 1,500 contractors. Because of the sensitive nature of their work, they can't share their accomplishments with friends and family. Details of many of the projects that have taken place at Groom Lake remain classified with good reason. The test site has been a valuable asset in development of revolutionary aircraft and weapons systems that enhance the readiness of our nation's warfighters and support national requirements. Though we have seen that not everything about Area 51 is secret, it is hard to change the public's perception that Groom Lake is an officially non-existent facility and that everything about it is classified. Various authors, news media, and television producers have exploited this aspect of the Area 51 mythos, shying away from historic facts in favor of reporting sensationalistic rumors. In an October 1987 article for the Las Vegas Review-Journal, 
Christopher Beale described Area 51 as a place with a history of dark rumors and speculation, and a name that has even now become an object of folklore. This is exactly why Area 51 has so captured the public's attention. People love mysteries. The less that is known about Area 51, the more it can be used as a blank slate for the public's imagination. Although the public may never know the full story of this unique national asset, much of it has been declassified. There are sources for accurate information about the history of Area 51, including books, websites, and museum exhibits developed with the participation of people who have actually worked at Groom Lake.